Our water, you know, really follows in very simple terms, a law from 1974 called the Safe Drinking Water Act. And under this act, only 91 chemicals, 91 chemicals are kind of monitored at all of the 160,000 wastewater treatment plants that keep 80% of the United States drinking water from the tap. Okay, so we have all of these 160,000 more or less wastewater treatment plants that have the ability to look at the levels, clean the water from soil, sediment, and a bunch of other things that come into it from lakes and streams and air quality uh, and air um, in rain and that kind of thing. And 91 chemicals are monitored for those levels of those harmful chemicals. And then they're either removed or remediated. Okay, but we have 95,000 that actually can and do get into our water. And so when you're talking about a 1974 law and none of those chemicals uh, that have been added since, which is about 90,000, 95,000 to a list of possible contaminants, the infrastructure hasn't changed. The laws haven't changed in those 50 years now. Um, so we're really talking about a big problem where the chemicals have gone crazy in terms of the legis you know, the ability to create them and push them into the market. And yet we're not fixing this water system that will feed right back into human health. We talk a lot on this podcast about different aspects of health, but have you ever asked yourself if the water you are drinking is safe? Does the water that you and your loved ones consume contain toxins that may be contributing to health problems? Today's guest, Dr. Ali Cohen, is here today to talk to us about chemicals in drinking water and the critical information you need to know to keep your family and yourself safe. I am Dr. Andrew Wong, co-founder of Capital Integrative Health. This is a podcast dedicated to transforming the consciousness around what it means to be healthy and understanding the root causes of disease and wellness. And one of the root causes of wellness is healthy drinking water. Dr. Ali Cohen is a board certified rheumatologist and integrative med medicine physician, as well as an environmental health specialist. Her medical practice located in Princeton, New Jersey, focuses on the Western medical and integrative approaches to a variety of health conditions in both adults and children, including rheumatologic disorders like arthritis and chronic pain, but also immune system dysfunction, environmental health and nutrition consultations. Don't miss this important conversation with Dr. Cohen today about why your drinking water may not be safe and what you could do to have healthier, safer drinking water that will support your optimal health. Well, thank you, Dr. Ali Cohen for coming on today. We're so honored to have you. Great. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah. So I saw that we do, we've had a lot of, of similar backgrounds, actually. You've um, trained with Dr. Andrew Weil. You're really um, well into the, the fellowship, uh, teaching, mentoring and things, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Just being part of it was great. Um, you know, and, and since that time we've done other projects and, um, I was just on his podcast. So that was really exciting because, uh, you know, it was both Dr. Victoria Mazes and Dr. Weil, and they have just a wonder rapport with their, with their, with their podcast. So yeah, it's been really fun and he's a friend awesome. and a mentor. So awesome. yeah. And then you've also done, um, acupuncture through the Helms course, correct? Yes. I, that was a long time ago. And, uh, you know, what I, what I gained from that, which was a lot of hours for your audience, uh, it's, Helms is a program for physicians to um, learn acupuncture and do it sort of in a little bit more of a fast track because there's an assumption that, you know, the anatomy and some physiology, of course. And um, I, what I came away having tried to, you know, do a lot of acupuncture within that time period of my life was that, first of all, it's a language. Second of all, you have to be really good at it. Third of all, you have to have like sort of running rooms at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. I just never thought that I was proficient enough. So I have a, such a strong appreciation, but I don't feel that it's something that I could continue to do within my own unit. So I have someone here who does it. That's why. And, and actually, as we're taping this live, you have an acupuncturist physically in the clinic now physically, correct? telling yes. me to shut up so <laughs> to be, we'll be quiet too. and and we we also have amazing acupuncturists here i think you know i've also done the helms training program as well um i i, I think just like you said that disclaimer of you know medical acupuncture licensed acupuncture is not not the same they're definitely getting a lot more training on tcm right. and the theory and chi and like where things go so i i definitely encourage people to you know do acupuncture but like you i kind of don't do it as much myself now 
now. Um, I kind of had that same um, same kind of uh, conclusion. But let's talk about your your background now. Um, Ailey, as uh, as an integrative rheumatologist, really groundbreaking in terms of you know we don't really see a lot of necessarily integrative specialists, especially in rheumatology. So I'd love to chat a bit on, about on that. Um, but but I think the other thing is that you know main topic today is really on on drinking water, and you've kind of gotten into you know the health of of the drinking water in in the U.S. and maybe other places. Um, you know, environmental toxins. You have an amazing website, The Smart Human, that, that we need to talk about at the end to make sure that people get that resource. But I, I first want to talk real broadly about, you know, what is the connection between, say, rheumatology and, and integrative rheumatology and, and environmental toxins? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, and I think I didn't know that answer for many years. And I think where I am now has been a culmination of different bodies of, of information and training that have some unbelievably, you know, has come together in such a beautiful way to really give me some perspective on human health and chronic illness, particularly in rheumatology, of course, which I'm board certified in. So, you know, to, in short, you know, we have a whole bunch of training that teaches us, you know, symptoms, diagnosis of the disease and therapy and treatment, usually pharmaceutical. That's what we learn in medical school. And what I began to learn about 15, 20 years is that environment plays a role in pet health, because that's how I first got into this topic was through my dog getting sick um, from exposures. And I didn't know why. And then I realized humans can also get sick from exposures to a variety of chemicals and, and out, you know, synthetic substances. And I realized that that too may have a strong impact on why we have such an enormous and growing uh, epidemic of, of immune system disorders, not just autoimmune, which is where our bodies attack itself um, in different organs, there's different names of these diseases like rheumatoid, lupus, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, MS, you know, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, um, but that, that chemicals, synthetic chemicals, which are not regulated in the United States, I mean, this is mind blowing for a lot yeah. of people and was for me, those chemicals are not required in the United States. We have 95,000 of them uh, approximately industrial chemicals that are used for cosmetics and cleaning products and you know personal care products they are not required by us law to be tested for safety or toxicity before they go into the products that we use every day Baby does that products. even make sense i mean i don't understand how it's that hard even to believe. got yeah i mean and passed, when i first yeah. learned this when my dog was sick and i was sort of stumbling across this information um, I really looked around in my kitchen. I was looking at my cat and going, is this true? Like, and then I had to really dive into the people I trusted who were researchers, um, including my co-author and try to really find out, is this really true? And as that body of information began to sort of unravel, and I, I really learned so much about the lack of regulation for these environmental exposures, at the same time learning this enormous increase in autoimmune disease, not, you know, or, or immune disorders, it started to really gel that there is a research level, there is a biologic cellular component to how these environmental exposures can affect the immune system, the endocrine system, and that that plays out in disease risk and de disease development. And I think that at the integrative medicine training was just icing on the cake, of course, because that was teaching me that not only are chemicals and environmental exposure, but our lifestyle affects our disease risk. So whether we get enough sleep affects our immune system, whether we, um, you know, due to quality of our sleep, but also the chemical reduction that goes on around our cerebral spinal fluid and our brains at night while we sleep. Um, you know, noise pollution, air pollution, um, anxiety and stress play a key role in not only development of disease, as we know from ACE trial, from, you know, some of our medical training um, and childhood trauma and how that predicts disease, but also, you know, currently how to manage your diseases that you have, you know, in terms of the stress level, the flares in rheumatoid or, or lupus, for example. So, you know, I think what happened was this was just a happy mistake of many different areas of learning and kind of an epiphany that these are all really affecting the same thing, which is a holistic approach to human health. 
Yes, thank you so much for the answer, Ailey. And, and we know that, you know, integrated medicine training does differ to some degree from conventional training. Like you said, it's more about, you know, band-aiding those symptoms, kind of suppressing those symptoms versus looking at a whole person, holistic approach, connecting the dots, it sounds like is what happened. With exactly, your, with looking your... upstream. I mean, you yeah. know, the idea is that we are taught so quickly that whatever we got was sort of, you know, that's it. It's our genes. Right. You know? And we kind of say, all right, it's our genes. The doctor on TV looks really respectable, white coat, and is telling us just to take this pill. And so you're like, all right, conversation done. But what we had to yourself with your training, myself, is just not be satisfied. And most of us in Western medicine don't even, well, I think more and more now we do know, but back then, at least 10, 20 years ago for me, I didn't know there was a whole body of, of evidence regarding nutrition affecting health. And thinking about evolution, you know, all my anthropology training in college was enormously beneficial to my perspective. Now I pull it into everything I do, every conversation with patients. We didn't just plop here with nice shoes and great cologne. We have been evolving and our bodies have required various forms of nutrition and clean water and clean air for millions of years. And now fast forward the last 100 years, we're being bombarded from chemicals from every angle, skin, oral, you know, from ingestion, air quality affecting our lungs, but even feminine care products, other routes or routes into the human body. And that's really been a very recent phenomenon that we're not taking into account for its correlation with increasing chronic health, uh, chronic and acute conditions. Great. So last now let's thank you so much. So let's let's actually start zeroing in now on on drinking water, mm -hmm. tap water. I think there's a saying of water, water everywhere, but no safe water to drink or something like that. So I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the status first of, of tap water in the U.S. And then how does U.S. water safety compare, say, to the rest of the world in terms of regulations and things like that? OK, so this is a huge topic and I'm hoping not to overwhelm people, but, you know, I'm just going to give very basic information. A lot more information is in obviously, I'm, you know, my book that I just wrote called Non-Toxic Guide to Living Healthy in a Chemical Great. World, which, with my own post is, by the way, because I'm so old, I forget all my information. Um, you know, there's a whole chapter that really, I think, in a very easy way, kind of lays out the problem, which is how I post on the smart human on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, is I always try to lay out the problem with an article on those posts, and then simply go into why they're a problem from a regulatory issue, why they're a problem for a human health issue, and um, where we can avoid the problem, and then where we can fix it in other areas, so that I try to make it more about avoidance than buying things, you know, so that mm -hmm. everyone can afford to keep their body clean and less toxic from harmful chemicals. So drinking water to start off in the United States, we, I assumed that all of our tap water was really super safe, right? And it is compared to many, many third world countries. And, you know, I lecture to people in South Africa, they have a huge issue with, um, you know, rubbish and, you know, uh, waste of their, of their um, you know, trash, which gets into their um, water systems. We have a ver variety of other major issues as well, but trash is not sort of highest on the list. We have a lot of other things that go along with that. But um, so countries around the world all have their varying issues of, of water issues. In, it's separate from access to clean water, we're talking about just why their water is not clean enough to drink or is not safe in many ways. Um, our water, you know, really follows in very simple terms, a law from 1974 called the Safe Drinking Water Act. And under this act, only 91 chemicals, 91 chemicals are kind of monitored at all of the 160,000 wastewater treatment plants that keep 80% of the United States drinking water from the tap, okay? So we have all of these 160,000 more or less wastewater treatment plants that have the ability to look at the levels, clean the water from soil, sediment, and a bunch of other things that come into it from lakes and streams and air quality uh, and air um, in rain and that kind of thing. And 91 chemicals are monitored for those levels of those harmful chemicals. And then they're either removed or remediated, okay? But we have 95,000 that actually can and do get into our water. And so when you're talking about a 1974 law and none of those chemicals uh, that have been added since, which is about 90,000, 95,000 list of possible contaminants, 
the infrastructure hasn't changed. The laws haven't changed in those 50 years now. Um, so we're really talking about a big problem where the chemicals have gone crazy in terms of the legis you know, the ability to create them and push them into the market. And yet we're not fixing this water system that will feed right back into human health and human, you know, risk for disease. Now that's municipal tap water. Then there's the whole issue of well water, which serves about 20%. So, you know, in you know, uh, municipal tap is 80% more or less. Well water in, you know, um, rural areas, schools, it depends on the population they serve. Wells can, um, you know, take up the lack, the last, less, you know, the rest of the slack. Wells have their own issues too, because wells, even personal wells in your backyard, they are not held to any high standard of testing. It is literally, you know, up to a homeowner to just test their water. And even when they test, it's a very limited number of chemicals. <laughs> Soil is very absorbent. So chemicals can actually travel from, you know, um, you know, contamination areas, Superfund sites, um, manufacturing runoff, um, any type of spill or a contaminant that's even 30, 40, 50 miles away from their well can certainly absorb some of those chemicals because soil is so absorbent and goes into the wells. But in this country, in order to understand what's in your well water, it's only required to test that water for safety of a small handful of harmful chemicals, including benzene, when you sell your home. So that is the only time. So people can live in their home for 20, 30, 40 years and never know what's in their wells. Um, and things change over time with flooding and climate change issues as well. So, you know, we re really have this issue where we think our water is clean, we think it's regulated. And yet by the time it travels, even from a, a municipal wastewater treatment plant could be 20, 30 miles, as in the case with my, um, you know, water company. And I've interviewed them and taken video and looked at their whole infrastructure, which they do everything they're supposed to do very well. Um, but they're, they're just limited by the law of 1974, which is only looking again at 91 chemicals from an estimated 95,000. So if we're missing 95,000 chemicals from, you know, that outdated law, what, what happens there next? What is the I guess what is the, you know, what are consumer, you know, you citizens supposed to do or, you know, what's kind of the next step there? Yeah, I mean, this is what I was sort of up in arms about. I'm thinking to myself, you know, 85% of our body is made up of water. We, no one, including myself, my whole life ever paid attention to water. Um, we just assumed it was clean. If you go to a restaurant, they plop water on your table and you drink it. You don't know if it's toilet water. You don't know if it's well water. You don't know where it's been. So we've taken a lot of liberties, I think, with our drinking water thinking since it's, you know, we're not a third world country that it's got to be regulated quite well. Um, so that became sort of the biggest beef out of all of the issues I manage and, and research in terms of chemical exposure. So I started to wonder, well, what am I going to do? What, what is my family going to do? I have young kids. I have pets, certainly one that was sick. Um, and, and that became a real journey for me. Um, so what I would say is that, number one, it is my strong belief that everyone now in the United States should be filtering their drinking water how they drink, how they filter is sort of, you know, one of those things where it has to be a cost related decision. Um, it has to be related to um, access to those filtration systems or, you know, pitchers or, you know, whether it's carbon block, which type of filtration system, you know, if you're a college student, you're moving from apartment apartment or you're just anyone moving from home to home, you want to think about is this something you're going to put in under your sink and, and, and have a plumber put in for 150 bucks, because they only run about 300 bucks now, some of the most aggressive forms like reverse osmosis. They used to be quite expensive, um, but now they're accessible to a lot of people. And so you have to decide, is this something that fits in my life for now? Or is this something I can take with me? Is this a pitcher situation or a refrigerator door carbon filter, which is much easier to change, has much faster flow of water, which also means it's going to remove less particulate matter and less contaminants. So there's all varying degrees of which, which filter you choose and what it's going to remove. We have an issue now, as many people might know, from with perfluoralkyl chemicals, which interestingly enough, I just posted um, yesterday on the new bipartisan, which is a beautiful word, uh, legislation to help to lower the contaminant 
a perfluoralkyl level in uh, municipal tap water nationally because it's become such a health hazard. And the allowable level at this point has been around 70 parts per trillion. There's been a huge amount of research by colleagues that I know and I'll be seeing next week for a whole week. They have been internationally looking at this problem of this whole class of chemicals that causes a whole bunch of health issues. And really their research is moving towards changing the government's view on this so that we can have lower EPA um, exposure guideline levels to seven parts per trillion or 11 for P PFOA. So, um, you know, these are just in individual classes. There's hundreds, if not thousands, but at least there's some movement. It's just going to take longer than I believe we have to wait. And as a rheumatologist who sees all these crazy, you know, or even normal, but older type of exposure related, you know, diseases like rheumatoid or lupus, they're happening younger, you know, food allergies, everything's happening younger. And a lot of these diseases are being diagnosed without any family history, yeah. which is saying that there's an exposure related component in a big way. The world's getting more toxic. There's more pollutants. There's the regulations haven't caught up yet with that, right. it sounds like. And I was going to mention that, too. Thanks for bringing that up about the PFOAs. It, it sounds like the conclusion now, based on the recent research, is that the, the safe level is really zero, correct? The safe level really is zero. And, and, and a lot of it comes down to also another aspect of is how, how fast do these chemicals break down? If you have a chemical like, for instance, bisphenol A, where some of your listeners might remember that BPA or bisphenol A was a really hot topic in, the, in 2010, 12, when they took it out of plastic baby bottles because of its ability to affect the endocrine system and the worry that it would affect young babies and their, and their hormonal systems, right? It was important enough to take it out of baby bottles that are plastic, but it still remains in canned foods. It lines the bottom of all, you know, the plastic lining of all canned foods, organic or not. It's on, you know, uh, receipts from any store you go to that ink is set on the paper with bisphenol A. Um, or BPA, which absorbs through the skin, not just through ingestion. So there are chemicals that we've, you know, have been removed or have been argued to be removed because of their toxicity. BPA happens to break down, um, has a half-life. So let's say it breaks down 50% um, in about six to eight hours in the human body, more or less. And then in another 50% will be removed in its next half-life. You know, so its half-lives are 50% um, in six to eight hours, and then you kind of calculate that. So it takes about maybe a week for our BPA exposure from a canned food or a canned soup to kind of wash out from the human body in a healthy human being. Well, it turns out the PFOS, the PFOAs, uh, and the P PFOAs, or the perfluoralkyls as a class, there's 5,000 of them, these compounds. Um, they are used to um, degrease um, machinery. They're used to... Um, uh, they're used in foams for, uh, you know, fire, firefighters, military. So they're really heavy in water uh, and waters, bodies of water around military bases, literally across the country. And they're used personally in our, um, you know, popcorn bags. They, they make things grease free. So they're in all our fast food wrappers. There's a big movement to reduce this class of chemicals from um, fast food wrappers, um, where else are they? They're, they're really located in so many places because they make things stain proof, grease proof, waterproof. And so it's a contaminant of, of worldwide concern. However, they break down in hundreds of years, like decades because of a fluorine component. So if you think about the compound itself, as opposed to BPA, the fluorine, which is a, um, halogen compound on our kids, you know, elements table, right? You can actually see the halogens in a vertical line, iodine, fluorine, bromine, chloride, or chlorine. Fluorine has a very strong attachment to the compound, to the, to the you know, to the PFAS chemicals. And that alone makes it almost impossible to break. So that fluorinated chemical makes these chemicals also known as forever chemicals, not break down in our environment with sun and heat, and weather, but also in our bodies. And so knowing that problem also raises its concern, right? Because, you know, whatever we do to the environment will cycle back into our bodies. We are not disconnected from water, from air, all of that. So I think that, you know, there's so many thousands of chemicals that are on the chopping block or should be in terms of their, um, you know, exposure guidelines from the EPA. 
But when you think about how they break down and how we can actually get rid of them if we made behavioral changes, this is not one of those that does very well with that. Got it. In terms of the, the PFOS and everything, is there a way to, to detox or eliminate them from the body in terms of, is it urination or sweat or, or do those not do that? Yeah. You know, so despite the fact that the chemical itself is pretty, um, uh, Indes tight in, yeah, in in almost like down. indestructible for, from, yeah, from a it, lifetime it's pretty perspective. Impervious. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it doesn't mean we can't not only avoid it getting into our bodies, which is what I talk about, you know, on my posts and with the book is try to avoid even getting them into your body by avoiding nonstick pans, stain free um, sprays, grease proofing, you know, fast food wrappers, um, you know, microwave popping bags for popcorn. You can certainly get the, you know, popcorn separate and use a machine or, you know, a stainless steel contraption. But the idea is all the ideas of not getting into your body makes sense for a variety of chemicals, but then also to get them out, you have to use anthropology. We have to think back to what makes us get rid of chemicals, sweating, clean drinking water, right? If you're going to detox, you don't want to detox with dirty water. Like that just sort of seems like you know, hypocrisy. So, um, you know, we really want to think about what makes human beings protect themselves physiologically, tap into that. It's, you know, exercise to sweat um, or sauna, you know, to sweat, but in a safe way. Um, it's drinking clean water to flush. You know, we say this for, you know, when we're sick, you know, they say chicken soup and water and flush the bug right out of you. It's the same kind of idea for chemicals. Okay. And um, so it's a two pronged approach. It's really don't put it in your body by being savvy about that, making good choices, understanding brands, which we teach in the book and websites that are really evergreen to keep those products, you know, fresh and, and, and manage those issues as they change their formulations. And it's also how do you get it out of the body in a very reasonable way where you don't freak out. Great. Thank you so much, Ailey. Do you have any specific water filter recommendations? Is, is that something found in your, your book? I know you said there's different price points and whether or not people are right. mobile or not. Yeah, there's lots of considerations and we give lots of guidelines, um, not guidelines, sort of guides, you know, so the book itself and the chapter is really great. I won't, you know, I'll never uh, disagree with that. But then there's also, you know, um, uh, Environmental Working Group. They have a uh, guide to filter choices. Guide oh, to I didn't filters. know that. Okay. Okay. That's in the book as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the um, United States government has a filter guide as well. Um, so there's lots of really reputable resources. We, as uh, you know, a philosophy, I've never promoted products. Um, my, my partner is a hardcore bench researcher. He absolutely would never do that either. But we want to make sure we get this information into schools, in college programs. And, you know, I teach other physicians. And so I think when your messaging is tainted by sales and promotion, I think you lose legitimacy. So that's been mm -hmm. a real goal of mine. Um, and so the book has no branding, um, but it has great websites that do that specific work of looking up couches without flame retardants. And they're, they're very good at that. This very good, you know, nonprofit that's run by Arlene Blum out of UCL, uh, UCLA Berkeley. And she was the you know researcher for fire retardants. Uh, back in the 70s and continues to work with PFOS. Then we have EWG. So we're giving the resources that people can do that branding and look up products, but we just chose not to do that. Um, we wanted to be the resource, the guidebook actually. Um, that being said, in terms of the types of filtration, I'll just talk about a few. Um, the easiest, simplest, the ones I had for years were basically pitchers that had a carbon block um, component where you drop it in, you know, Brita, Zero Water. I mean, I can name, there's so many on the market now. And, you know, of course they do a pretty decent job, but you have to know what they remove. And that you can find from the manufacturers, you call them, there's various forms of Brita filters and Zero Waters and all that. So there's different, you know, levels of contamination removal based on their own studies with in-house, right? So you have to sort of take their word for it. There's not a lot in terms, Consumer Reports does a great job of vetting these out. Um, if you want to sign up for consumer reports. That being said, you know, any filtration system that's going to move water quickly is going to remove less. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, you could imagine that. So when you're talking about the extremes, you're talking about the carbon blocks are easy, fast, you can remove them. They're relatively inexpensive, but not so much over time. Believe it or not, they add up those drop-ins. They, they can be quite pricey. Whereas if you go to the exact opposite extreme, the most aggressive way, 
to clean U.S. drinking water or any water that we have available as U.S. citizens, not corporations, is reverse osmosis. And those are now cheap enough. I mean, mine was 275. Um, I got mine out of California. I've used them for 20 years and they used to be a thousand, 1200, but like everything else in life, like VHS machines and, you know, they start off expensive and huge cell phones. Yeah. And over time, they eventually get cheaper, 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 smaller, 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 and then you can't even give them away. Right. Yeah. So that's where we're heading. And that's a good thing because I don't expect people to buy bottled water, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Yes. Bottled water is very expensive over time. You also drink all of the plastics that may have dissolved through heat or whatever from where they're stored into your water. So I always say it's cheaper to get even an aggressive reverse osmosis for 275, 300, have a plumber put it in in one hour because it should not be complicated. Plumbers should not tell you that it is or else you have the wrong plumber. One hour for like $150 here on the, on the Northeast in New Jersey. And then it comes with the filtration system all set up so you don't have to do anything for a year and then it would be 40 bucks a year to replace the cartridges so to me the upfront costs actually are far cheaper than buying pallets of plastics contributing to plastic waste and then also contributing to plastics in your body yeah that's a great answer i think that you answered the question about is bottled water better than tap water it sounds like it's clear that a filtration system that Filters something, whether it's carbon block or RO or something, is going to be better than than drinking microplastics, essentially, which is what's happening. Right, essentially yeah. microplastics and yeah. also 75% of most tap water is, I mean, of bottled water is tap water. So it's really interesting when you go and you get tap uh, bottled water, which people do when they travel. I do too. People do when they have, God forbid, there's an exposure to your water system, contaminants. Sometimes there's a you know bottled water yeah. issue from your township. I do say do that as well. You know, boil your water, do whatever that's what they're told. But if you can do 80 to 90 percent of your water from home where you fill up at home, the point of use, which is your sink, whether it's well or municipal tap, you're doing it under your sink and use glass and stainless steel, of course, to carry that new fresh clean water or cleaner water, that's a really valuable thing to do. Um, and you save money and it's not, it's not hard to create that system, but it also really reduces exposure quite a bit. One little side question, thank you so much. One, mm -hmm. one little side question for the Brita p pitchers and everything like that. Since their pitchers themselves are plastic, w would that be a concern in terms of carrying that? Or and, and same with reverse osmosis. There's components of a reverse osmosis uh, machine that really, you know, seems hip hypocritical, right? It's plastic, but you know, we have to work with what we have available. Yeah. And you know, I tell my husband, if you're going to make coffee, use a French press. You know, try not to use one of those, um, you know, plastic machine things where you pop it in and it's waste and all that business. But it's hot plastics are always worse. So when I think about plastics for pitchers or reverse osmosis, think about the the most important thing is that that plastic's not heated. It's not stored in a hot place like bottled water often is and travels in unrefrigerated mm -hmm. trucks. So think about that because when plastics are heated up in the dishwasher traveling or in warehouses, that's when most chemicals can leach from that plastic matrix. Um, you can see that in, in Tupperware when you when you get it, it's clear when you buy it and a couple washes later at high temperature in a dishwasher, it's opaque. So that's telling you that that matrix is not strong enough to maintain its chemical structure. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that bottled water is an option and sometimes, you know, sometimes, but most of the time, if you can avoid it, I think that's a much better way to go. And, and always look, you know, I went to a conference in Nashville and I went and got uh, bottled water because of course I couldn't take my reverse osmosis with me. And, um, it actually said in ingredients, municipal filtered water or municipal, uh, yeah, municipal filtered water as if that was supposed to make me happy. <laughs> and I'm thinking municipal tap water. That's exactly what it was. It was filled up, sold for $2 in the hotel. And it was basically tap water in a bottle. So, so they should have said city tap water, right? Yeah. They said municipal filter. Yeah, I mean, filtered. I took pictures. I think yeah. I posted. So I, I kind of walked yes. through my life taking pictures and sharing it with everyone because it's my perspective and kind of humorous. And But I just was sort of like, wow, I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah. Yeah. How, how many people do you think, just around the country, just listeners, uh, who... 
how many people are aware of all these issues with water? I, I feel like most people, I mean, or to some degree, like people have different pictures and stuff, but, but just the degree of, to which our water can be contaminated, you know, and, and, and also how it connects with human health or animal. Yeah. Health I mean, it's, it's quite shocking actually, but you know, but I'm not surprised. I'm not, I can't make judgment because I, for 30 years of my life, didn't even care. You know, I was drinking Diet Dr. Pepper during residency three times a day. I mean, you know, you, you know, life is very difficult cost-wise now, and we've got yeah. all sorts of world issues. I mean, I would just say that water has never really been a lot of people's, you know, on their thought process. What I find most interesting is that the health and wellness world, you know, the people who actually seem to really care about fitness and, you know, powders and shakes and nutrition, no one is paying attention to this. Like, it's almost like, I kept questioning myself, am I wrong to be upset about this? Like I'm learning everything. And yet I can't imagine that no one is as upset about the gallons of water that we throw in our body, but people are complaining about how much fat or protein or which diet, Whole30 or Pegan or, you know, it to, mar to me, it's really like we're missing a huge, you know, influx of, of contaminant and that it's something that really doesn't take a lot of effort or really mm. any money to fix and be conscious of. So it's become the, I, I should say, it has risen to the top, no pun, pun intended, <laughs> as the biggest beef I have with um, environmental health, in environmental health, not with, but in environmental health, because of the volume, the risk to benefit ratio, you know, the volume we're exposed to and, and sort of the risk to benefit ratio that has, has just really seemed to be on fire. It's funny, even when you go to integrative conferences or, you know, a health food store, you can drink these like really fancy protein powders. But then if you're putting contaminated water in there, you know, what about baby food, you know, baby yeah. formula? Yeah. You know, what about the gym? I always I wrote in my in the back of this book, a lot of things like how to, you know, things to think about when you travel, things to think about at the gym, just because I'm walking through life in these places, even drink, you know, beer and wine. I happen to like, uh, you know, some alcohol here and there. And I wanted people to know what are the issues with contaminants of beer and wine, how to choose better. So or soccer turf my kids play sports so I have a whole section on what's the issue with turf sports mm. turf you know because mm. you don't want to just take your kids off the field so a lot of this is sort of real life living yeah. um, at least as a mom as a practitioner and um, you know you walk through life and you have to sort of think about these changes that you make in a way that's reasonable that doesn't you know freak people out um, but I find that water is going to become more and more of an issue for people I think um not just from a human health perspective where we have issues, um, you know, with chemicals in water that affect hormones such as fertility, you know, so when these things start to hit home where we're having a, a fertility issue, we're having an enormous a number of hypothyroid, hyperthyroid, thyroid conditions, not, you know, just that, but we have Hashimoto's, which is autoimmune, but we also have just basic um, hypo and hyperthyroid. We have thyroid medullary cancer. So thyroid cancer has really, you know, become, um, risen dramatically. Um, do you, is that tied to water? Do you feel like that's tied so to water? So interestingly enough, there's no real connection to that alone. But let me give your audience a little interesting piece of advice that I talk about in the book. Our thyroid gland is so vulnerable and we need iodine. Iodine is a, com is a halogenated component on our elements table, not far off from fluorine. Um, but it's a good guy and we need it. We need it for protection of our thyroid gland. It sits there and protects it. We don't make it as, as the human body doesn't make it. So we have to get it from diet or we have to get it from supplements. We just have to get it. And especially in pregnant women, because they pass that on to their baby and can prevent a lot of risk for, um, you know, IQ and cognitive issues, you know, because babies need it from their mom. So it's even tested often in, in pregnancy, but Iodine no longer is part of our diet. It used to be in bread. It was subsidized as a public health measure. Iodine was, you know, it's usually part of a seafood diet, which a lot of people in the United States either can't eat, don't eat, or can't afford, don't have access to all that. And we have contaminant issues in seafood as well. Some people are worried about that as well. So iodine has become very low in terms of our nutrient uh, rich diet. What that does is it leaves the thyroid gland vulnerable without it. And many of the chemicals like perchlorate, cyothionate, and nitrate, which is on food washes, in our soil, they, those chemicals in particular have been studied and they attach to the thyroid gland very strongly. 
So if there's no iodine to sit there as a very cheap nutrient that we can buy or get anywhere and eat anywhere if we think about it, it's empty, we're vulnerable. Then these chemicals come in and they are hormone disrupting chemicals which have been strongly linked to risks for thyroid disease. So when you say that about water being a potential risk, I say, of course, because, you know, you have cyanide, you know, thiocyanate, nitrate, perchlorate, all of these are food washes. They go down the sink. They end up in our wastewater treatment plant. Why wouldn't they be a, a risk just as much as any other chemical or exposure? And in, in combination with the fact that we're iodine deficient as a population, it sounds exactly. like and that helps Right. And I, I recommend patients get a multivitamin with enough iodine. So yeah. again, if you're not getting it from other sources, you're not, you know, sea salt, we all cook with sea salt now that doesn't typically have iodine because we think it's healthier, but table salt often did have iodine subsidized into it. So the idea is if you're not getting it nutritionally, you want to think about how to do that because food is always better than supplements. But then if you're not going to be consistent, then you may want to consider a multivitamin or something that you're going to consistently take to, to replenish that. Thank you. So the, Dr. Cohn, the, the rheumatological conditions that you see in your integrated practice, um, like lupus and RA and uh, Sjogren's and things like that. So, you know, this is going to actually, I mean, I, I hate to tease this up as this is my next book that I'm working on is not just the endocrine effects of environmental chemicals, because we have enormous amount of data research internationally, thousands of reports, the World Health Organization, American Academy of Pediatrics, the Endocrine Society, you name the society, and they now have a statement on endocrine disruption um, in a variety of health conditions. That being said, the immune system has been sorely overlooked. And I'm going to handle that in terms of grabbing the best of the best information from really well-vetted research around the world. And I'm going to tie that in it's been tied in before, but hasn't gotten any attention. So I'm going to really try to talk about how these chemicals, these environmental exposures, even stress and light, noise, pollution, all those things I'm going to tie in as well. Um, anxiety, try, you know, all of these things, poor sleep, they are all environmental components that, that make the immune system not work to its fullest. And as anthropologic, you know, species, you know, that have evolved for millions of years, we weren't meant to have our immune system revved up every day. And we're now at a point where we have this baseline level of inflammatory status for a variety of reasons. So it doesn't take much like even COVID-19. I wrote a paper with my co-author on this early on in COVID that we sort of have this tinderbox where we're living in inflammatory sort of, you know, at a level that doesn't take much to set us off. And we saw that in terms of how many people with chronic health conditions inflame, you know, uncontrolled diabetes, you know, hypertension, obesity had a much higher risk of being ventilated and have morbidity and mortality. And so that wasn't clear in the beginning. And now I think we are very well versed on the fact that that's an issue. So I'm going to tie a lot of those chemicals and how they sort of trigger the immune system um, into, you know, being overactive. And that, in fact, can can lead to a lot of uh, both acute and chronic health conditions. Well, we're very excited to uh, have your second book come out. Uh, and uh, when is that planned? Uh, are you do you have a timeline it's yet? It's not penned yet. It's getting proposals being put together, and hopefully that'll that'll be about a twelve month writing period from the time it gets you know um, a, a publisher. So it's a process. This is a really big yeah. process of book writing and stuff, but it's important stuff, and I think it has to be done well, or else I don't want to do it. Makes you know? sense, yeah. Yeah. Go big or go home, right? Isn't that the? Uh, yes, <laughs> that's it's my a, favorite expression. It, really nice, nice. Yeah. yeah. So, so really, um, it's so important because you know a lot of times we'll see people with autoimmune conditions in the clinic, and they're they're like, why do I have this? And like you said, they're 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 younger and younger. They're sicker and sicker. They don't have the genetic, you know, uh, factors, the connection. So what's happening? The missing link is environmental toxins. So Water that's a big link. I don't want to ever mm. hang anyone's hat on that alone because right. again, you know, and, and our lives are fluid, right? So, you know, when I'm having McDonald's for most of my childhood and not thinking twice about it, now I'm having green salads that are organic every morning for breakfast. We don't know what component of that caused some damage down the line. We don't really know because, you know, whether de we develop a disease of any kind is a dance between three things, our genetics, which tee up whether or not we're at risk, you know, for changes in, in our health. Lifestyle, which we have control over in many cases, most cases, and environmental chemicals. 
which is a component of lifestyle, but really I separate that out. So the things that we can control instead of being our genetics per se would be the things like our sleep, our diet, our clean drinking water or not, our, our air quality, our toxic relationships, our air quality, water quality, um, you know, noise pollution, air pollution, radiation. You know, I have a whole chapter on how to use cell phone and, and technology safely, especially with kids. And it's just reasonable. It's not to say get rid of everything. So all of these components that affect the human body, we have more control over and they will shape whether our genetics, our ep ex exposome or our, exp uh, our epigenetics, which is the proteins that, you know, sit in our gen genes and decide whether those genes will get expressed or not. We can control those proteins with lifestyle and environment. That's what exposomics is. And so the idea is that we have much more control over our future risk of disease than we think we do, or we've been led to believe. Yeah. So um, let's talk about kind of some fun closing questions now. Thank you so much for being on today, Ailey. Um, we could talk about uh, kind of some healthy morning routines because we know that kind of getting a good start to the day is a really good right. thing for health. Um, uh, what what kind of, uh, yeah, I, I kind of want to talk to you about the morning routine and maybe what beverage you drink. Maybe you drink a nice clean glass of water or something. <laughs> yeah, I usually start with a clean glass of reverse osmosis water. Um, I actually double filter it now with um, one of the pitcher filters because I did a, I outsourced water testing of my own home, uh, you know, testing the tap water versus the RO water to see if I was really getting what I thought I was getting. There's a company called Tap Score who I don't mind mentioning because um, I think they're a really good company and I have nothing to do with them, but I just wanted to see if there was a company that would test my water well, Tap score, uh, okay. do it well. And, and they did it. It was expensive. So I wouldn't necessarily say anyone should do it unless they're sort of academic and trying to lecture to people like I do and give good information. But um, you know, for the money you spend testing, you could actually buy an RO filter. Hmm. So to me, it's not a really smart use of money unless mm -hmm. you really feel you have to. So anyway, they found that I had some VOCs in my water despite the RO filter. Hmm. And VOCs are volatile organic compounds that are removed nicely from carbon block. So I just whipped out my old pitcher filter and I just double filter it. So that's probably more information than you needed, but <laughs> TMI. But um, water I start with, I love organic um, loose leaf tea. Earl, Earl Grey is my my choice. I love it. Loose leaf is great because you don't get microplastics from tea bags. So I really encourage people who love tea and coffee to always try to get, you know, where you cut it, you, you know, you chop it yourself or you get loose leaf because you'll avoid that rayon and all those synthetic plastics in the bag themselves, which is a study that's in the book. And we talk about a lot. I think a lot of people mention that now. Um, but Earl Grey actually lowers uh, the bergamot that's used to flavor Earl Grey lowers LDL cholesterol. So I find that helpful. And the fact that it's USDA organic, I use USDA organic uh, filtered water, you know, sugar cane, that's USDA organic, and even a little creamer um, for some people who don't mind dairy. That's really a nice way for me to, you know, my routine. And then I do a little intermittent fasting because I can, I'm not a diabetic. I don't have uncontrolled, you know, vitals of any kind. So I do a little intermittent fasting. So I won't eat for about three or four or five hours just to still give my GI system a break from overnight. And then I'll have a huge salad. I love a big salad, which was a joke back when I was a kid or even in my 20s and 30s, would never have imagined that. But no breakfast food that you typically think of other than eggs for me, you know, no breads and scones and bagels. And, um, and so that's a good way to start my day. And I always have some type of fruit with it. Um, and my protein of choice is cottage cheese because it's so accessible, organic. Um, I could just plop it on and I have a nice source of protein that's low in fat. And then, uh, or I'll just put a chicken strip on there or I'll put um, any leftovers from the dinner before. So, so that's how I start my day. Sometimes it goes south from there, but <laughs> at least I make a good effort in the morning. Awesome. That's so great. Well, thank you, Dr. Cohen, for coming on today. Uh, how can listeners learn more about you and work with you and read your books and everything? So thank you. Um, so first of all, wonderful being on your show. Always great to reach new audiences who have never heard of these topics. So thank you for having me and being interested. Honestly, when we met in New York, I was just thrilled to meet you and, and hear of your interest in this topic. Um, I am located in Princeton, New Jersey, although I do telemedicine. I'm still taking new patients, although I'm really overwhelmed um, because of just so much interest in the area of integrative medicine, the area of rheumatology, and the area of environmental health. So I do get quite a lot of of 
requests, but I am trying still to do that because I want to help as many people as I can. Um, so I do telemedicine. I'm in my office here, um, but I also post Monday, Wednesday, Friday, religiously really on Facebook. And I have done that for many years. Um, Fridays are usually mental health Fridays with something fun, interesting, useful. Mondays are sustainability ideas, oceans, how environment state changes, plastics. And Wednesdays tend to be more nutritiously oriented, something about nutrition, chemicals, that kind of thing. So very useful. I don't sell anything, but I encourage people to follow on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, I also I'm, have I'm sorry, a podcast uh, myself. Ailey, you said What's the smart on? human. Is that, is that your called, handle yeah, for all you. of your, all it's of your all the social smart media? Human. The smart human. Okay. Or at the smart human, Instagram, Twitter, or the smart human with spaces for Facebook. Okay. Um, and I have a podcast called the smart human. Um, surprise, surprise. And nice. I'm really have a lot of interesting researchers, people who don't have voices typically, you know, environmental yeah. health researchers, environmental lawyers, um, some celebrities like Fran Drescher, we just had on, um, I have Robert Lustig coming up, talk awesome. about sugar as an environmental yeah. exposure. Yeah. But then also the website is the smarthuman.com where they can see all of these podcasts that I, and YouTube channel, which, you know, has all of these podcasts. If anyone should miss any good information. Great. And have to check out your podcast. Sounds really amazing. And then you have a book out, the non-toxic, um, the, then a yeah. future book coming out, but, uh, but the, yeah. the non-toxic definitely one to check out. And again, um, thank you, Ailey. Yes, there it is. I like yeah. I have a yeah. textbook, but I think sometimes it's a little heady unless you're really into that. It's really intense textbook, which has chapters written by the smartest people in the field of drinking water, food additives, um, there's what, a chapter, what is it called? Uh, your it's textbook? called environment, uh, integrative environmental medicine. It's is that one of the, the Andrew Weil yeah, library? Oh, yeah. you know he what? That's the one I that's don't... academic yeah. as well as now the new consumer guides, which both are written within those series. Yeah. Um, but it have, you know, there's integrative cardiology, integrative pediatrics, integrative neurology, and now there's integrative environmental medicine, which I was, you know, tasked with putting together with my co-author again. Um, so that's a deep dive into environmental health from the gut microbiome and chemicals all the way through to food additives, to radiation. Um, but then this consumer version is a much more easy read. It's meant for high school and up. And it's really just, I hope, you know, entertaining as well as really, really useful. So um, you can find that on Amazon, Barnes and Noble and all those. Great. Well, thank you, Ailey, for coming on. Super fun and informative as well. So um, definitely keep in touch and uh, would love to have you back when you write your second book. I know this is going to be a, a big topic moving forward with everyone, you know, environmental health and how it affects yeah. the immune system and everything. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong. I really appreciate you having me on, being interested, and, uh, and thanks to your crew for putting it together. All right. I hope you enjoy the next Broadway show too. So yeah, thank great. you. I'll be, I'll be thinking about you and your crew. So thank, <laughs> thank you. you. I appreciate that. Thanks Dr. Cohen. Thank you for taking the time to listen to us today. If you enjoyed this conversation, please take a moment to leave us a review. It helps our podcast to reach more listeners. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss our next episodes and conversations. And thank you so much again for being with us.